Let's assume we have a set of around 10 points in the plane, like these ones. And for each of these points, we have the elevation. Then what we call spatial interpolation is the process of estimating the value of uh, the attribute, so in our case, the elevation, at locations that are not sampled. And we do this by uh, trying to find a function that would fit or pass very closely to all the points that we have defined. So if we look at the 1D case, so for example, if we define a one-dimensional coordinate system and then we have a few points like these ones. So the aim of interpolation would be to find a function that would, as I said, pass very closely. Of course, there's an infinity of functions that can be passed through these points. So the aim is to find the uh, function that will approximate the best the shape of the terrain. Interpolation is used in several fields in engineering and in sciences. Uh, and depending on the application for which it's used, uh, we want the interpolation method to have different properties. So here I'm listing seven uh, properties of an ideal interpolation method. Most of the properties that I'm listing come from the book Contouring of Dave Watson. So if we go quickly over these properties, uh, the first one is uh, exact. So exact means that if we have a set of points, it's in 1D, the same thing, an exact interpolant or an exact, the, the, the result of an interpolation method will create a surface that we call the interpolant. So the interpolant is exact if it goes through or if it honors the original samples that were collected to study the field. Uh, if we explain the second concept, so the second concept is uh, continuity and smoothness. We can say that continuity in mathematics, we would call it a C0 interpolant, and smooth, we would call it C1 interpolant. C0 interpolant is one where the interpolant is continuous, so at every location we have a value. But uh, C0, if we look, the derivative at certain point, for example, at this point, is undefined, so we don't know what it is. So a C1 interpolant is one for which the first derivative of the interpolant is known everywhere. And if we continue like this, a C2 interpolant is one where the uh, second derivative, so I drew the same thing because it's more difficult to draw a uh, C2 interpolant, but it's, uh, it's an interpolant for which the second derivative is known at every point. Then the fourth property is local so it means that if we want to interpolate at a given location here for example we will only use neighbors that are in the vicinity of the points where we want to interpolate it means that we will not try to look for points that are far away to the fifth one is that the interpolant should be adaptable which means that the function should give realistic results for data distributions that are not normal data distributions that are anisotropic this happens a lot in gis because when we collect data for example what we've seen in a previous uh, lesson for bathymetric data set uh, samples are collected by a boat following certain lines as you can see here so if we wanted to interpolate with such a data set, then we don't want to take points that are only along one given line, but also uh, we would like our interpolant to adapt to the situation and be able to collect points that are all around uh, the location where we want to interpolate. Uh, six one is computationally efficient. Uh, nothing special to say about that. It means that basically it must be possible to implement it so that the result can be obtained in a reasonable time reasonable time depends on the application but we wouldn't like to wait an hour to uh, obtain our result and the seventh one is automatic um, that's something that is not always possible depending on the methods that we're using but automatic would mean that there's no user defined parameters so some interpolation methods are very good but they require the user to really have a good understanding of the data set. And uh, based on that, the user needs to define several parameters and to tweak them to obtain 
a result. This is something that can lead to a good interpolation method, but this is also something that requires the user to have very good knowledge of the data set. And often you don't have good knowledge of the data set when you want to interpolate. You just want to click a button and get a reasonable uh, answer. So something that is automatic or something for which the parameters could be uh, automatically derived is something that is wished. Now let's discuss the fitting of a polynomial as a way to spatially interpolate. We know that if we have n points in the Euclidean space in 3D, then it's always possible to find at least one polynomial which has a degree of uh, maximum n minus 1 that will pass through all the points that we have in 3D. If we look at the case in 1D, as you can see here, so if we have these points, so we can always find a polynomial that will approximate the samples. If we want to ensure that this polynomial goes through exactly all the points, then we might need to use a degree that is pretty high, depending on the distribution of our point. It could be that if we have 100 points, this polynomial would be of degree 59, for example. It would take a lot of time to find, but it's possible to find it. The problem with it is that uh, since we want the interpolant to be exact, uh, it's known that uh, when polynomials start to have a high degree, and high degree can be something above 10, for example, there's something, uh, the interpolant will start to oscillate between the points. So it means that instead of simply having this, we would have something like this. So the interpolant passes through all the points, but between the points, uh, it starts to oscillate and it can go higher and lower than the values. Instead, what is often being used in practice are splines. Splines are piecewise polynomials. This means that if we have a set of points in 2D, like these, then we divide uh, the data set, all the points, in a certain way, for example, in four rectangles. And each of the rectangles, that we call an area, will contain a subset of the point, let's say around 100 points. And for each area, we create a polynomial of degree that is considered rather low, for example, 3, 4, or 5. So we ensure that inside each of the piece, we have a polynomial, which is a function, which is continuous and smooth. And the only important aspect that we need to consider is that at the junction of the different areas, we need to ensure that the interpolant is continuous and smooth. So that is, for example, C2. Details of how this is done are, however, out of scope for this course. While polynomials and splines are sometimes used in GIS for spatial interpolation, weighted average methods are much more common. We describe in the book five different weighted average methods. We won't cover these in detail in this video, instead we'll just look at the basic principles which they all share. Let's say we have a set of elevation samples like these, and we want to estimate the elevation at an unsampled location. A weighted average interpolation method will give you two rules. The first one will be, it will tell you which subsets of the points should be used if you want to estimate the elevation at a, the unsampled location. And the second one, it will give you for each of the sample that you've selected, so from your subset, what is the importance of each? What is the weight that is assigned to each of these? In practice, this can take many different forms. We see in the book five different interpolation methods that all follow these two rules. The most known and used weighted average interpolation method is inverse distance to a power. It uses a searching circle for the rule number one. Here you can see an orange circle having a radius of 10 meters that is drawn around the interpolation location. All the sample points inside this circle will be used as a subset of the data set. In this case, we have three samples. Their importance is inversely proportional to, the, to their distance to the interpolation location. The closer they are, the more importance they will get. And once we know which sample should be used for the interpolation and we know which weight to apply, then all weighted average interpolation functions are like this. So the function which uh, takes x, the location uh, usually on the plane in 2D of the interpolation location, is equal to the sum. So we do the sum of all the samples that we have. In our case, we would have three. 
And then WI is the weight assigned to each point and Z is the elevation of every point. And then to we normalize everything, so we divide by the sum of all the weights. And then that gives us the uh, estimation for the elevation at the location X. In the textbook, you can read about the details of several interpolation methods. Notice that in order for you to get a better understanding of the results you obtain with each of these methods, we've implemented them all for the same set of sample points for an area uh, somewhere in Tasmania in Australia. If you go to the URL shown at the bottom here, you can download the resulting files, which are uh, raster files, all of the same size, and with every method we've interpolated exactly at the same location. We also give you a QGIS3 project that will allow you to explore and compare the resulting surface that you obtain, that we obtain with each of the methods. Here we can see the terrain obtained from linearly interpolating in a tin with Delaunay triangles. Notice that since the samples are very far from each other, the samples are the red points that you see overlaid on the surface, you can clearly see the triangles and their edges. If instead we use natural neighbor interpolation, you can see how smoother of a surface we obtain, and you can also notice how it can be made even smoother if the gradient uh, at each sample is used to modify the weight. So we obtain something that's even smoother. You can also see the influence uh, that the parameters of inverse distance to a power, IDW, will have, on the will have on the resulting terrain. For example, you can see that uh, if we modify uh, simply the radius or the power, then we can obtain a surface that is drastically different. Notice also here how nearest neighbor, also called closest neighbor, yields a totally unrealistic terrain. Finally, notice that with the QGIS project that we give you, you can modify and extract information from all the terrain files that are given to you. For example, here I'm using the Goodall function contouring to extract the contour lines directly from one of the terrain that we got, the natural neighbor interpolation, and then the resulting contour lines are directly overlaid in 3D, and that can help you to have a better understanding of the morphology of the terrain that's created with a given uh, interpolation method.